I'm going to be talking about a research project at the University of Haifa, Israel. And um, it's a project laid, led by a professor of linguistics, and it's called the Grammar of the Body, also known as Gramby. Now, this is an interdisciplinary research project that enjoyed a generous grant from the European Research Council. Um, they are very generous. And it's a five-year project. Um, and it has the sign language lab w w headed by the same professor who leads, who is the uh, PI on the, on the entire project, Professor Wendy Sandler, who is a professor of linguistics, and um, a brain research lab that works on the way through functional MRI, how we identify uh, body posture of winners and losers in athletic competitions. Uh, so that's another one. Another one is uh, Freie Universität and Max Planck Institute research on communication among chimpanzees. And that's what I do and what I teach, and I've been doing for a long, uh, a long time. And she asked me if I thought theater could be part of that. And I appreciated that because what she actually was proposing is a theater laboratory so that we can do research like the other ones, but without functional MRI. So we'll, uh, and uh, that's a picture I took in a, a, a Bisu shrine in Kyoto, and I sent it immediately to all the actors in Israel. Some of you who visited Jap Japan may know a Bisu from the beer, because Sapporo uh, Brewery produces in the Sapporo Quarter produces uh, Ebisu beer, and that's after that god, is a god, one of the seven gods of fortune in Shinto religion. He's also called the laughing god, you see why. And he's the fisherman god because you see he has a fishing rod and a, a fat fish under his left arm. <coughs> and when you enter the shrine, you have to knock hard several times because he's hard of hearing. He needs to know that you're there to worship him etc etc as opposed to everything else i proposed to the group during the process which usually created immediately an argument and different or this was accepted unanimously abisu is the name and <coughs> we identify with it it's a research it's a granted research so we need to define our goals we did and uh, one is to explore the performative elements of Israeli sign language. For those of you unfamiliar with sign languages, they exist just like any other languages. They differ from one country, from one culture, not from one country, because in several countries, there's more than one sign language. For example, in Israel, small, tiny Israel, there are more than one. There are some Arab villages and Bedouin villages that developed unknowing, not knowing of, unaware of their existence of Israeli sign language 70 years ago, they developed their own language, own sign language, and actually Wendy's international reputation derives from that. She, was, she and her colleagues were the first to uh, spot that community and to analyze their language, and they still follow their language and how it developed from one generation to another. Fascinating, fascinating. Um, second, Study ASL as resource for theatrical creation. That's where we meet sign language and I and the actors. And develop a form of visual theater that was a big challenge based on linguistic and artistic devices and aimed at deaf and hearing spectators without simultaneous interpretation. And again, for those of you unfamiliar <coughs> with uh, deaf theater, the model Almost throughout the world, we see it in international deaf theater festivals, almost throughout the world is the model set uh, in the late 1960s here in Connecticut by the National Theater of the Deaf, which is a model of sign language theater simultaneously translated or acted by hearing actors so that hearing audience, uh, audiences could do it. While I was working, I went to see one of the hits of Deaf West Theater, another uh, successful thing, on Broadway, Spring Awakening, a musical. Deaf people doing musical a bit strange. And, um, and they did it with singer, um, um, actor-singers who doubled, 
for the signing actor, except for the actor in the lead, who is a hearing actor who signs fluently so he could speak. And, and uh, my impression of that and of other theaters of that kind that I saw and keep going to is that sign language is being marginalized because us as a majority hearing people, we get our information first from the ears. We can't block that. So we see as a result sign language as a kind of a nice movement or dance that decorates the drama rather than face it as the only source of information and deal with it, be challenged by it. So that was the first thing I and the actors agreed on was that we're going to, we didn't know how, do that. And the third, and the fourth, yeah, it's number, yeah, I don't count too well, obviously. <laughs> uh, I was aware of that in grammar school. Uh, so the fourth is to reinforce deaf culture, and that's a kind of a byproduct. I wasn't aware of that because I knew nothing about deaf culture at the beginning. I learned a lot through the actors. Um, so that was uh, um, added retroactively. Maybe that's why. And we have two phases, one from 2014 to 16, which included, um, it's listed like forging the group's identity first and establishing working methods second, but they're combined. You can't separate them. And the product of phase one was a show called It's Not About a Beatty, which traveled internationally, actually was uh, here in New York City uh, four years ago, or three years ago, in performing the World uh, Conference at Castillo Theater. Phase two began, and it began with a more in-depth exploration of sign language, including metaphors, um, compositionality, which is the main subject of grammar of the body, compositionality being how simple elements of language um, work together to create complex structures and how these complex structures become meaningful from that those small units. So we studied that, and the second production was uh, uh, different from the first, which was a stage show, environmental theater. It's called Their Language, and Their Language uh, is, you know, a play of words on, the, on, on their language from whatever perspective you see it. And it's basically on the oppression of the deaf in the uh, educational, public education system in Israel. Um, and not only in Israel, but uh, we focused on Israel. Uh, so we have seven actors, one deaf, and it was the first time in Israel that act deaf actors were paid for their work. And the important thing was, for me, the novelty was, especially in the context of uh, the entire grammar, grammar of the Body project, was that as opposed to academic research, where the actors were acting, videotaped, and then analyzed. The important thing is to say that if you watch people communicating in sign language, you will not understand a thing. Although there's a preconception, not totally unjustified, that a lot of this is pantomimical or miming things. So I'll illustrate that. This was taken during a break. Two actors were talking. So could you understand anything? Did you eat? Yes, it's not hungry. Did you eat? I have a headache. Did you eat? Did you drink? So what you need to do is hurry home and then immediately go to sleep, which is probably, w which is what is frozen now on the screen. But if you don't have the context and you don't know any of it, you won't be able to understand it, especially because it's everyday communication, so it goes fast. And you can't stop. But if you do have a key or something, now I'm going to help you. What would you like to eat? That's um, the um, um, Deaf Association of Israel is putting on website um, of Israeli Sign Language. They do it in the States too. Um, so what would you like to eat?
Now you could say, right, that this is to eat, right? In Egypt, this is to eat, right? In Japan, this is to eat. <laughs> Japanese sign language, right? So you see why it's different, and you also see that the, the, the logic that, or the, the imagination that leads it is, is similar, is coming from the same place. Now how we develop the ensemble. I brought the first elementary unit of my method, which uh, we're going to work with in the workshop now, and that is a movement that repeats itself several times without any cognitive report. It's just, uh, just a movement. And the movement starts with, um, it's meaningless. It's meaningless. But once repeated ritualistically, it gains momentum, energy, and <laughs> meaning. <laughs> and I keep playing with it as it transforms without my pushing it to any other meaning. But it kind of leads me to You'll all be trying that <laughs> soon. Okay, we're going to do a compressed version of what I did with the actors. So we're going to start with a repetitious movement um, that develops, and we're going to start it by doing an exercise we call solo and choir, in which I will be the first solo leading you, and that's just like any movement game that you know, you just do, you mirror me. But after you gain confidence in that stream, in that way how the movement develops by repeating it, one of you will replace me. And you can take your time, but don't take too much time because then you will be less brave. Um, so, and then will replace me, will be soloist for a while, and then please, please, Take your time before you change it. Repeat, repeat it enough time so it, it will let. Don't change yet. Right. And it's more difficult to change, to replace the leader if we move in the room, but it's possible. that this is a real compression, <laughs> oppression, <laughs> depression, <laughs> uh, that we need to take time to get to that, but what you did is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're beautiful. 